This conference will now be recorded. Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's Friends of the Library Hertha Hella Forum titled Our National Parks featuring Barbara Cameroon. Please mute your microphone so that the speaker can be highlighted in your application. If you have any questions for the speaker, please use the chat functionality of GoToMeeting and send a message to everyone so that we don't duplicate the questions. After the presentation, I will relay these to Ms. Camarud. And if you have any technical issues, please use the chat function to message me, the host, or call my office at 532-5974. We will be recording this presentation and we'll upload it to the library website so you will be able to enjoy it again at your leisure. Now I would like to introduce Downtown Friends of the Library Forum Chair, Martha Tucker. I welcome you also and thank you for attending our first Downtown Friends Virtual Forum. It's not possible to gather as a group at this time, so we're so grateful to the library staff, especially Marianne Lennox, for making this virtual forum possible, and Melanie Thornton for helping us to promote the forum. One of the things I've missed the most during the pandemic is being able to travel. Our well-traveled presenter is going to take us on a virtual trip to many of America's national parks. As Barbara describes the off-the-beaten-path treasures that she and her husband have discovered, you will be inspired to plan your own virtual, your own real trips to the national parks. Barbara Cameroon is a retired teacher. When she and her husband retired, one of the things they wanted to do was travel. They decided to start with the U.S. and to visit all the national parks. She is the parent of two children and has four grandchildren. In her words, life can't get any better. Barbara Cameroon. I want to take this time to thank the Friends of the Library and the Helter, Her Helter, Helter Heller Forum for inviting me to give this presentation, and especially to Mary Ann for setting it up. Now I want to thank you, our viewers, for spending a small part of your day with us. Let's get started. The first picture on my title page of the presentation is the Panachrome District of Denali National Park. It is back in the wilderness. Okay. Wait a minute, Marianne. Our national parks are lessons in extremes, from the arid deserts of the Southwest to the rainforest of the Pacific Northwest, from the lowest point in America to the top of North America's tallest peak, from tropical climates of the Caribbean to the Arctic regions of Alaska. The beauty, the grandeur, and the magnificence is unrivaled. I have organized this uh, unit by geographical location. So let's begin with the national parks in the east. It's hard to think of Acadia in Maine without seeing pink granite, rocky seashores, carriage roads, and Sone Sound, the only fjord on the East Coast. Horse carriage trails, 16 bridges, all different and dated. And if you notice on the slide up here, let's see, will it show on, no, it won't. There is under that bridge, well, actually it's on the bridge, it's one of the rocks. It's dated 19, uh, yeah, 1924. Uh, the first picture that we have showing here, we took a carriage ride on the Roosevelt's carriage trails that he set out, he laid out, and covered them in pink granite that had been uh, crushed. Uh, the next page, be picture below it, is the Beehive Trail. 
And if you notice, it's very rocky at first. Let you know that it does smooth out to dirt and it's much nicer. Uh, our next picture up there with the people on it is Baker Island. If you notice in the background, you can see nothing. That's fog. When we left uh, our, uh, Acadia, got in a boat and we were covered in fog all the way out to the island. We didn't see anything until we got there. And the last picture down at the bottom is uh, Cadillac Mountain, the highest point in the park. And it's looking out over Mount Desert Narrows. Our next park is Okay, Marianne, this is doing something weird. Here it is, it's a Biscayne in Florida. It's primarily a water-based water -based park. Because of the water conditions, no boats would be going out for the next three or four uh, days out to the island or making swimming and snorkeling trips. We shall return. We did hang around the visitor center, which is the building you see in the upper part of the thing, of the screen. And uh, going out on either side of the visitor center, there were on one side, which is the top picture under where it says Biscayne Bay, a boardwalk. And below that, you see me walking on the boardwalk and it was beautiful. It was mangrove forest all along the side on both of those trails. The picture down at the bottom across from that is the jetty walk, which is on the other side of the visitor center. Moving along. Okay. Let's see, where are you? We're on the Congaree. Which one do you want? This one. Okay. Con Congaree in South Carolina is the largest contig contiguous area of old growth floodplain hardwood forest remaining on our continent. Ball cypress, tupelo, and loblolly pine are predominant. 25 are champion trees, six of which are national champions. The first picture that we see under the word Congaree is a boardwalk. And going out from the visitor center, you have boardwalks all around there because all of that area floods and you've got to be up above it. In the spring, especially when the floods are the worst, you can canoe in there. Below that is a picture of a toad. And I thought, why would toads be living in a water area? But they, they were, I don't know what kind he is, but he was quite cute and he sat there and let me take his picture. The next one, you see the Tupelo and Ball Cypress trees in the uh, floodplain, and the tree on the edge of the screen is the champion Loblolly Pine. If you look up at the top of the picture, you see a mosquito meter. We were there at the right time of the year because it goes from all clear up to war zone. Cuyahoga Valley in Northern Ohio was preserved to protect the towpath known as the Ohio and the Erie Canal connecting Lake Erie to the Ohio River. The towpath picture that you see is one of the locks and it would hold a 15 by 90 foot barge that carried the, the cargo down to the Ohio River. Uh, Brandywine Falls is next to that. It's one of the falls in the park that is really lovely. Below that is Brandywine, Brandywine, Brandywine Creek. And over beside Brandywine Creek, I call that tree tenacity. It is holding on for all it can it's worth. Dry Tortugas, 70 miles southwest of Key, of Key West, is known for abundant sea life, migratory birds, beautiful colored coral reefs, sunken ships and treasures. On Garden Key sits Fort Jefferson, a three-tiered octagonal coastal fortress, the largest masonry structure in the Western Hemisphere, and it was never completed. 
we have this the uh, entrance to the fort. Next to that, we have a sign that points to Dr. Mudd's cell. And Dr. Mudd was the physician who assisted John Wilkes Booth after he assassinated uh, Lincoln. Of course, at that time, he didn't know what was going on. The picture next to his cell sign is you can see the deterioration of the fort sitting out on an island. And maintenance and upkeep is a non-ending job. The parade, the parade grounds of the fort below the entrance picture is covered in trees. During the days of the fort in operation, there were none of the trees there. You see in the next picture a covered hallway that runs around the whole fort. And off of that to the right are rooms you can go into and they were uh, quarters and uh, supplies and all kinds of things that. And up in the corner above that is a little burrowing owl sitting in the, the wall there. The Everglades in South Florida is known as the River of Grass. If you look at the bottom picture on the screen, you can see the water under the grass and it is a very clear, clean water. Uh, a strangler fig is on the tree underneath the word uh, Everglades. It will eventually kill that tree. When we went on the sluice log, we went with a ranger. It was raining that day. And he said, do you want to go? We were the only two people that showed up. He said, do you want to go? I said, we're going to get wet up to our knees, maybe below. So we'll have some coming down from the top that will kind of even it out. But in the trees, you see the bromeliads that are there and they were blooming. Uh, the, the flowers don't really show up, but it was really a wonderful, exciting visit. Uh, visit out to one of the hammocks where the trees are able to grow. The last picture is the uh, canoe trail. We took a canoe trip one day and it was lovely. Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee and North Carolina is the most visited park in the National Park Service and the first, pic first park on our official trip. This park is known for its mountain vistas its biodiversity, its cultural history, and the beauty of the ancient mountains. I laughed and said, that's a man with his train. That's my husband. He was so excited. He got there. He saw it. It's great. And uh, that wreck happened. We understand the uh, engineer on the train had had a little uh, enhancement to his breakfast and was not in the best of conditions when he drove it. Because of the biodiversity of the park, and I'm a wildflower person, I had to throw in their dwarfed crested, dwarfed crested irises, fire pink, trillium, and who can go to the Smokies without seeing a bear? Hot Springs is known for its hot baths. It is also has a pine oak hickory forest. It is our smallest, it was our smallest national park. Uh, now there's one park that's even smaller than that at 98 square miles, I think, or something. It's, but anyway, uh, at the top, that is Gulfa Creek, which is the campground is just over that rock wall. And it's one of our favorite campgrounds in all of the national parks. Very small, very uh, compact, but it's just a beautiful setting. We have Bathhouse Row on um, the large picture down under Hot Springs. And the last picture is a view from Tower Drive up around the park. We did a little hiking there, but it was really not anything that was uh, outstanding. Our next park in Kentucky is Mammoth Cave. It has 365 miles of map trails in the cave. It is the largest in the world. It has many miles of hiking trails, an old time ferry, and its plant diversity rivals the Smoky Mountains. Uh, if you look at the sinkhole plains, in, and that's the largest picture there, you'll see indentions in the soil. And those are sinkholes from the karst environment where the water washes through. 
and it is just uh, a beautiful scene to see. The smallest uh, cave opener, it's not a, really a cave, is Mammoth Dome Sink, and the last one down there is uh, White Cave. The whole area is just full of caves. Shenandoah running the, through central Virginia along a ridge line of the Blue Ridge Mountains is normally beautiful skyline vistas, but our recent trip saw five days of rain and fog. Our neighbors in one of our campgrounds was a mother bear and two cubs made life interesting. The slender, uh, well, it's called Slender Waterfalls was on one of the trails that we hiked, and I just love all the greenery, the smallness of the waterfalls. It didn't make a rushing, roaring sound. Uh, turkey tail fungus is on the tree there. That is the largest growth of turkey tail fungus I have ever seen. Uh, Rose Loop, Rose River Loop Trail followed one of the rivers and it was, it again was very lush and green. Down at the bottom, we have uh, white snake root we have ferns and we have lichen on rocks. If you can tell, I enjoy the minutiae of the park as well as the grand vistas. Our next park is Virgin Islands. Oops. It's on St. John's in the US Virgin Islands. It's a tropical paradise filled with white sand beaches, lush tropical forest, sugar plantation ruins, marine life, and tropical birds. Vir uh, Virgin Islands is also rich in history as well as a haven, haven for hiking, snorkeling, kayaking, and relaxing. The first picture where the sailboats are is Maho Bay. And if you look up, you see the mountains, you see little white dots up there. We stayed at Maho Bay Ecological Resort which has now closed, unfortunately, but it was a wonderful place to stay. Down below one of our snorkeling trips, we, we uh, were on, we saw a hawksbill turtle and was very excited for that. The last picture is not actually in the park, but I just wanted you to know there are people otherwhere that do the same thing that we do. The sign there on the wall says, are you ready for this? Thou shalt not park here. Guess what? Somebody did. Wolf Trap in Virginia is the only park dedicated to the performing arts. When Rhodes began to encroach on her property, Catherine Filene Schaus donated her farm, originally bought as retreat for her children from their DC home to the federal government to be preserved as a park. We have at the top the main theater, which we have seen so much. Underneath the covering there are seatings you can buy or you can eat your uh, picnic lunch out on the lawn and watch the performance. The second picture down there is theater in the woods and there they hold smaller concerts or theater and it is, it is back in the woods, literally. Moving on to the Midwestern parks, and this term, ladies and gentlemen, is used very loosely because some of them are, anyway, some of them are nor, more northerly Midwestern. The Badlands and south of Southwest to South Dakota are a mixture of Badlands and mixed prairie. The first picture that we see was in the second unit of the park, and it is Sheep Mountain Table. And I guess they call it a table because so many, uh, so much of that is level at the top, but the, I just love the features there and they were so pretty. The second picture up on the top are some of the Badlands, but you see colors in them, reds and yellows. And that is a result of iron ore that is in with, mixed in with the sand and soil. Below is a bison, which you will see in the prairies, of course. And that was, that was there were some of, some of the first bison that we saw. And the last picture down at the bottom is just a 
picture of the Badlands and what they look like from the road. Moving along to Grand Teton, this is where I saw my first moose, I was so excited. Anyway, the scenery speaks for itself. Jackson Hole Valley crossed by the Snake River with the Tetons providing the backdrop. You couldn't get any better. The Grand Tetons rise out of the valley floor without any foothills. Mount Moran in the top picture under Grand Teton is there at Oxbow Bend in the Snake River. And it was just one of those beautiful pictures that you see, you can't believe it's real. Next to that is my moose in the, in the, the shade. And the bottom one is the plains looking in up to the Grand Tetons. Isle Royal is located on an island in northwestern Lake Superior, accessible by boat or float plane. Eastern end is accessible from Copper Harbor, Michigan. The western end from Grand Portage, Minnesota. It is home to the longest running predator prey study in the history of the US and maybe the world. The first picture at the top is Scoville Point. And if you hike from the boat ramp all the way to the east end of the island, this is what you'll see. It's a little bit of a longish hike, but it is absolutely beautiful. If you are there when the berries are fruiting, you can eat them. Thimbleberry is down uh, above the uh, Royal and blueberries and raspberries are also there. So we had wonderful hikes eating blueberries, thimbleberries and raspberries. The last picture is the boat to the island that we took to get out there. Our next mountain is the Rocky Mountain National Park. It goes from, in Colorado, it goes from the Lush Valley to Longs Peak, towering over 14,000 feet. We arrived during the elk rut and they were taking over everywhere, the golf course, parking lots, anywhere they could do it. But anyway, so there, we, if you see up at the top, there are people that are parking along the side of the road. There is a car coming toward us, but they're out and they're taking pictures of the elks doing their thing. Uh, the next picture next to the cars are is Alluvial Falls. And I fell in love with this waterfalls, even though it does, it's not a really big one, but it was just the beauty of the green, the evergreen trees, the ones beginning to change color and all the rocks that were in it. We have a bugling elk down at the bottom under the cars. He is trying to raise his harem and be ready for uh, mating season. The last picture is cleared Trail Ridge Road. Now, if you can imagine, we're down, there's no snows. If you want to go from Estes Park side of the park over to the other side, you had to go over Estes Park Road. We had been waiting for three or four road, three or four days for them to get that road cleared. And if you look, this is the snow at the top of the mountain going over the road. Our next park is Theodore Roosevelt. It's the only park named for an individual. It is in Western North Dakota. And uh, it has three units, the North unit, the South unit, and Elkhorn Ranch unit. From bright bison to prairie dogs, I even got on a horse and I hadn't ridden a horse in over 50 years. And we rode across the, the plains there. It was just beautiful. While the South unit is the most developed, the North unit with its badlands, solitude, and colorful landscape can't be beat. Our first picture is of the little Missouri River Valley, and you can kind of see some of the colors in the bad, these are badlands of North Dakota. There are bison at our camp for one morning when we got up. I got up, I was gonna run over to the bathhouse. There were actually two under our awning, and these were out beyond those. So it was, I decided I closed the door and went back in, I'd use our facilities. 
the rock down in the lower corner is one of the foundation rocks that's left from Theodore Roosevelt's home at the ranch. Uh, cottonwood is known for decaying quite rapidly, so the house did not last a long time. The last picture is part of the Badlands, and I bet everywhere you've seen bison, they've always been on a prairie. There are bison on that way up at the top, you see two, uh, then if you come down a little ways, there's three more, and if you come down a little ways more, there are two of them. So they're not totally prairie animals. Voyagers is a water-based park in northern Minnesota that protects part of the boundary water route the Voyagers use to move pelts from western Canada, Canada to Montreal. Uh, there was a gentleman uh, named Elmsworth, Elmsworth from uh, Chicago who came out and this is the bottom picture in the I don't know whether you're seeing it on the left or the right but it's all rock he built these beautiful gardens and uh, the park is in the process of restoring them now Johnny and I are standing at a art sculpture that was there in the gardens up at the top next to that picture we went out in a boat tour of the park or part of the park it's quite extensive and there is a tree with a bald eagle's nest in it the next picture was water and trees that's essentially what the whole park looks like it is just beautiful and underneath that is kettle falls a hotel it is a uh, Wait a minute, I lost my place. Kettle Falls Hotel was built in 1913. They didn't build a foundation to the park, I mean, to the hotel. They have come back in, or they were working on it when we were there and build, trying to get a foundation built. But the bar end shows the slant. The, the pool table in there has a huge wedge rubbed uh, under one side of the table. Our next park is Wind Cave in South Dakota, just south of uh, Custer State Park. It, it, the, the, uh, it was discovered in 1881 by two brothers who were drawn to it by the cave's whistling sound produced by the force of the wind flowing from the cave. The cave has 95% of the world's boxwork work formation. As I said, the first picture is the historic entrance to the cave. Can you imagine not knowing what's down that hole going through it? I can't. Below it is some of the box work. This is more closely woven. There were part of it that was formed like more rectangles and they used it as a post office. Heading, to, heading sort of to the Southwest, we're going to see some of our Southwestern parks. Wait a minute. Oh, I forgot Carlsbad. I forgot Carlsbad Caverns here. These are actually in the Midwest more. In the Chihuahuan Desert, no, they're not. That's southwestern New Mexico. Uh, is home to 400,000 Mexican free tail bats from April to October. In the evening or at sunset, you can go to the opening of the cave and watch the bats come out to go to their feeding grounds. If you're an early riser, if you're an early riser, you can get up and in the morning and you watch from the amphitheater that's there below the opening, you can watch them leave and come back early in the morning if that's your thing to do. Our next part is Yellowstone which is, uh, has all four varieties of thermal features, geysers, steam vents or, or fumaroles, hot springs, and mud pots. There are five districts, Old Faithful, Norris Geyser Basin, Mason, Mammoth Hot Springs, Grand, Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, and the Lake District. The first picture that we see is Terrace Spring, which I love just for the beautiful range of colors from the golds to the oranges to the greens it's just gorgeous the next picture we see are bison and if you know they're laying in the road you stop 
you're not supposed to get within 50, 75, 100 yards of one. So you stop and you wait for him to get up and go. Or if you, it's really not legal because you're not that far away from him. You couldn't drive around if no one's coming your direction. But that's just uh, something to be aware of. The next picture down under uh, Terrace Springs is the river, Yosem Yosemite, Yellowstone River above the falls, and it is rushing toward the falls. The last picture is Back Pallet Spring, which is part of Mammoth Hot Springs. It's actually a beautiful area. We are, whoops, we are now going to, follow, to look closely at the southwestern part. But first we're gonna do the five carts that are in Southern Utah, and they're in a row across the Southern um, land there. With the highest concentration of natural arches in the world, arches in Southern Utah is a must see, a must sight to see and explore, and its name explains it all. Our first pic picture there is Balanced Rock, and it really is balanced. Our next one going across is Delicate Arch, which is on the uh, uh, Utah license plate, at least it was when we were there. Down below that under Balance Rock is Double Arch, and the last picture are the Coke Ovens formations that look like Coke ov Ovens. Canyon Lands is the next part, is divided into four districts, Island in the Sky, the Needles, the Maze, and Horseshoe Canyon. We went to Island in the Sky because the other two were not uh, open. Biological soil crust, which is in the middle picture in there, is colonies of microscopic organ living organisms, usually hundreds of years old, that work to stabilize the soil, concentrate moisture, and build new soil. It is made up of cyanobacteria and includes lichens, mosses, green algae, microfungi, and bacteria. It is thought to be one of the colonizers of Earth's early landforms. In our first picture under Canyon Lands, we have cave spring cowboy camps with some cow cowboys at some point in history camped out there while we they were conducting their work. The next picture shows the confluence of the Green and Colorado rivers. It's not as it appears as it should be. The Green River is really the Brown River and, and the Green Colored River is really the Brown, is really the Brown River and the Colorado River is really the Green River. Uh, and the last picture down at the bottom is a grand viewpoint vista that looks down into all the canyons that are formed. You can, if you have a four wheel drive vehicle, you can drive down and there's a road down there that will take you on a tour of some of the sites. Ever heard of hoodoos? Bryce Canyon is full of them. They come in all shapes and sizes and fill the Bryce Amphitheater. The hoodoos are siltstone and mudstone capped by a weak limestone or dolomite cap. Wind, water, or freeze thaw cycles and erosion make for an ever-changing park. Bryce Canyon is really a series of horseshoe-shaped amphitheaters. The first picture under Bryce Canyon are hoodoos along the rim drive. The second, oh, well, the second picture is me coming out the switchbacks from taking the Fairyland Trail uh, hike, which the picture below it is part of the Fairyland Trail hike. You go at one end of the amphitheaters, it's a 10 mile hike in, and then the other end you come out where I am going up the switchbacks. The last picture is just a simple window on a fin. And part of the structures are very thin and long and narrow, and they're called fins. Capitol Reef is another unexpected surprise. Fruta was a Mormon settlement, settlement and their family orchards still remain. You're welcome to eat fruit when the trees are fruiting. All that you eat within the orchard is free. If you take it with you, there's a nominal charge. Capitol Reef 
is far is home to the water pocket fold, which is the top picture. It is a classic monocline, a hundred mile warp in the Earth's crust. Next to that under Capitol Reef is the Bahunin cabin. That, believe it or not, is for a family of 10. Four of them, the mother, father, and two children slept in the cabin. And at night, the father uh, cleared out uh, in the rock behind them places for the other six children to sleep. Uh, we have underneath that, we have the Capitol Reef Pioneer Register, which people signed as they came over the mountains. And this road was horrible. We hiked on it all the way back. It was rocks. It was everything but what we consider a road today. Uh, the last picture is Cohab Canyon Trail, the start of it. Zion is our next park. It is magnificent in scenery and fascinating geological uh, formations. The Virgin River throw, flows through the canyon, canyon floor. If you look up at the top, can, up the top where uh, we have the pale colored uh, rocks, that is called checkerboard mesa because there are lines on it that run horizontal and vertical that make it look like a checkerboard. The uh, next to that is Colab, Colab Canyon, which is a second unit of the park. There's a drive all the way through. The majority of it looks kind of like this with the rocks and the sand and the, and the greenery and the uh, evergreen trees. There are hikes that you can do. The day that we went over there, it was so we were late getting there and so we didn't get out we just looked at it because it's beautiful and you don't want to miss it if you don't have to the next round before it is a uh, down below it is the virgin river with a small waterfall and it is just it's just a beautiful river it's very quiet it's very smooth it's very still it does have some waterfalls though the last picture shows the saddle out to Angel's Landing. And uh, I stayed over here where it's a, the pale rock is called Chicken Out Point. That is a 12 to 1300 foot drop to the valley floor. If you fall off of that little ridge and then you climb up the mountain and Angel Point is up on the top. Uh, I didn't go, my husband did and I wished him well all the way along the river. We are now heading to our southwestern parts. Big Bend is the largest, least visited park. It is in Texas. While there is a lot of hiking, viewing wildlife, gorgeous views, scenery, wildflowers don't miss St. Elena Canyon, a great rafting trip with canyon walls rising 1,500 feet above you in some areas. The day we went, it took us just a day to go through there. Normally that trip would have been two or three days, but the river was so high from all the rains they had had, we just zipped through. We did stop on a sandbar and eat lunch, but it was really great. The, the picture in the top is Juniper Canyon from Lost Mine Trail. We never found Lost Mine Mound. Uh, the last picture is uh, our campground was down at the bottom of that greenery there. And this is moon over Casa Grande. The big rock up there was called Casa Grande. It was quite lovely. Black Canyon of the Gungeon, which we had never heard of before starting this trip, is a small Grand Canyon in some respects. The Gunnison River has cut a deep gorge known for its narrow opening sheer walls and extreme depth, 2,722 2, feet at Warner's Point. The canyon runs for 48 miles, 14 are protected in the park. There are north and south rims, both worth visiting. We were there the end of uh, September 
the gamble oak there had turned a beautiful gold and yellow and orange and it's a beautiful contrast between the evergreens of the canyon. Below that is the trail out to Warner's Point and the twisted juniper kind of marks your path. And of course we've got uh, Gunnison Canyon there down the last of it. Our next park is Great Basin in Eastern Nevada. And as the name implies, is a vast geographical region region of sagebrush valleys and mountain known for its lack of drainage, covering 200,000 square miles in Nevada, California, Wyoming, Idaho, and Oregon, the streams and rivers have no outlet to the sea and water evaporation creates shallow salt lakes, marshes, mud flats. Have you ever heard of the Great Salt Lake and Montable uh, Salt Flats? They're in the Great Basin. Ironically, the, the National Park is a mountainous island in the Great Basin. The first picture up there under uh, over Great Basin is Wheeler Peak, which is the highest point in the park. The picture next to it with all the pink in it is a meadow where all of the pink that you see there is pink shooting star. It was absolutely beautiful. Our next picture under Great Basin is snow affected trees. They are on the slope and as snow slides down the, meet, the, the incline there, you can see how it has bent the trees. Our next is South Fork of Baker Creek and it was just absolutely roaring that day. Our last picture is Stella Lake and that is one of the salt uh, lakes that is in that area. Great Sand Dunes is home to the tallest sand dunes in North America. They are over 750 feet tall, cover 30 square miles, and uh, it's just a unique experience in Colorado. This is not near the beach, this is Colorado. And if you go to Great Sand Dunes, they will tell you how the dunes are stabilized because of they, they go from a sage brush, brush plain in the San Luis Mountains to alpine tundra in the Sangrea, Sangrea de Cristo Mountains. Plant and animal life is diverse and our first picture at the top is the dunes from the Montville Nature Trail. Uh, the picture next to it is uh, uh, Mosca Creek which is a very small, uh, with a very small waterfall. Can you tell I love the minutia of the parks? And the next one, we climbed the dunes, an hour and a half up the dune, and this is on the top, 30 minutes to get down. You ski down, kind of. It's kind of a weird thing, but it was fun. Our next is uh, Guadalupe Mountains. It has the highest point in Texas at 8,749 feet and preserves one of the finest examples of an ancient marine forest fossil reef on earth. Our first picture is me going up the trail to the top. Our second picture down below that is we made it to the top. Um, over uh, beside Guadalupe Mountains, we have the Devil's Staircase that is a set, it's, this is all formed by rock, and it's a staircase up to Devil's Hall, which is the bottom picture. You notice there's not much vegetation in it there. Mesa Verde in southwest Colorado protects over 4,000 known archaeological sites, with 600 of these being cliff dwellings. The first picture is the Nordenskeld ruins. And Nordenskeld was a guy who came over from Sweden. He uh, visited the park. He took back to Sweden a lot of the artifacts that were found there. And he, it was a result of the uh, uh, 1906 Antiquities Act where it forbid that from happening. 
The second picture is one of the current ragers who was portraying Nessie Nussbaum, who was the first ranger uh, to become superintendent of the park that had a degree in archeology. span This was in 1921 and people were still taking things from the park and he, uh, he was in period time of 1921 and it was a very interesting presentation he made. Down below us, we see the Mesa Canyon view and over in the whitish picture, you see that dark line in it? This is one of the few snakes we have seen on our whole na in 51 national parks. This is one of the few three snakes that we saw during that time. Our next park is the Petrified Forest and Painted Desert in East Central Arizona. It's just south of I-40 and was set aside to protect the petrified wood for its scientific value. Pueblo ruins painted up, uh, oh, the bottom below Petrified Forest is the Puerco Pueblo ruins and that's what's left of it. Up above it is part of the Painted Desert and below it is a piece of petrified wood. And if you notice all the various colors in there, they are created by different types of minerals. Suaro is our next park in Arizona. It's in the southern, in the Sonora Desert. It was, it was established to protect the saguaro cactus, a symbol of the West. It is divided into two districts, the Rincon Mountain District to the east, and the Tucson Mountain in the west. Our first picture shows desert ecology. We have a saguaro cactus, we have choyos, we have a uh, prickly pear, and it's just a good example of what grew in the western portion. We have petroglyphs in this park, as well as many of the other western park, and down below we have a choya bloom from a choya cactus. California has nine next national parks. We're going there next. The Channel Islands is made up of five islands, Anacapa, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, San Miguel, and Santa Barbara. We were there before the season opened and we were able to go to Anacapa and Santa Cruz, the only two apple, uh, islands that we're going to at that time. Our first picture under Channel Islands is Arch Rock that's part of Anacapa. And uh, you see the lighthouse up at the top and it's just a beautiful, uh, just a beautiful uh, area. The next picture is of the giant Coreopsis. It's so pretty. The Santa Cruz coastline is down below Channel Islands. Uh, the next picture is an adobe farmhouse on Santa Cruz, which is now a visitor center. We were fortunate to be there, ha, 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 during uh, seagull nesting season. And all of these seagulls have got a nest somewhere out in uh, that. A lot of that is, uh, 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 it's a ground cover they use on the mainland to protect it's along the interstate and all, and it's, it has become invasive on those islands, but they're nest in there for all of those birds. And the last one is just, it's uh, on the way out to the island, there was this, uh, there's several buoys like this, and it, this one was not as covered as other, but it was sea lions and gulls. Our next tree, did I skip Death Valley? There we go is home to Badwater Basin, the lowest point in North America at 282 feet below sea level. The, the year we went, the wildflowers were everywhere. We were told it was a mini super bloom. The first picture is Artist Drive along the castle, along the park. And it was just, it's all the different colors in the mountains there and it just was beautiful. The next picture down below is Desert Gold. And if you look, you can see the yellow there. You can see the pictures taken up close and personal, but then if you look along the road and over on the other side, you can't see it as well. It's, was a, it was a carpet of gold. It was beautiful. Up in the middle of the screen is the desert five spot. 
These are cell, uh, solitary flowers that are just, they're translucent. And when the sun hits them, they just, they glow. It's beautiful, they're gorgeous. The last picture is a uh, devil's golf course, which doesn't look like it would be a lot of fun to play golf there if you ask me. Our next park is Joshua Tree in southeastern California. It's home to its namesake, the Joshua Tree. Within the park, three different ecosystems converge, providing three different growing zones, Colorado Desert, Southeast Mojave Desert, and above 4,000 feet, you have a pinion pine, California juniper community. The first picture that we see under Joshua Tree is the Joshua Tree cactus. And up in the corner of that picture, I have a, uh, a sample of the bloom that comes on that cactus. Below it is the Key Ranch. The picture over, uh, it's a, a single little building, is the schoolhouse there. The Key Ranch is, as you can see, a lot of it is ruined. Uh, the house is still there, but it was beginning to show some sign of uh, an issue there going on. Uh, I am walking through the Desert Choya Garden in the next picture, and above that is Skull Rock, which kind of looks like a skull. Kings Canyon is a backpacker's paradise. It contains the largest stand of old growth conifer forest in the world. South Fork of Kings River is the first picture up at the top. Below that, Johnny is standing in, Johnny's five foot ten and a half. He is standing in Fallen Monarch, which you can tell how wide, how big that tree was. We have the General Grant tree, and the next one we have is a trail along Hume Lake. Lassen is our next park. Lassen Volcano last erupted in 1914 to 15. It is home to four types of volcanoes, cinder cone volcanoes, composite volcanoes, shield volcanoes, and lava domes. We see a picture of Lassen there in the background. The next picture over is me hiking the trail to the top of Lassen. Unfortunately, I could only go about halfway. They had the trail barricaded because they were working on the top of it. The next trip is a trail along Kings Creek, and it's just a beautiful shaded walk that was so pleasant. Below that is Pinnacles. It was the newest national park when we visited. While it is a very small park, there's a lot of historical and geological figures. It is also home to the California condor. The first picture is some of the Pinnacles in Pinnacle Park. The next one is a lake formed by a dam here in the front of the picture that the CCC built. And between those two pictures, they have tarantulas there, which I wasn't really excited about. Our next park is Redwoods, and it's home to its, ne its namesake, the Coast Redwoods. Sitka spruce grow along the coast, and the redwoods and Douglas fir are the predominant trees. You can tell that this is a moist area by all the lush, beautiful greenery you're looking at. The foggy coast, su coast supplies about 25% of the moistures the trees require to survive. Our first picture under redwoods is a quiet walkway. It's truly an experience, a spiritual experience to walk among these magnificent trees that have been there for thousands of years. The next picture is Trillium Falls, which is on the other side of the screen. And it's just, it's, I'm just excited about all of the greenery that's there. Below it is what is called skunk cabbage. When we parked our RV, I, we got out and I, I smelled skunk. This is not good. We shouldn't be here. And luckily the guy next door to us uh, let us know that that was skunk cabbage and that was what was causing there were no skunks there. Uh, lush ferns in between that and the Trillium grandiflora, which is in its final stages, they come out and they bloom and they're white and as they decline, they turn the pinkish color. Sequoia is our next park. It is home to my Whitney, 
at 14,491 feet. It is the highest peak in the lower 48. We have a picture of uh, Morro Rock, which if you drive around in front of it, you can then drive around to the back of it and go up. You'll see me walking out on the top of Morro Rock toward the edge so that you can see a beautiful view from there. Uh, below me is uh, the trees at the General Sherman. This is General Sherman, right? Yes, Sher Sherman tree. That's the tree. These are the benches in the back behind it covered in snow. So uh, we had to camp on the parking lot of the campground. Even the picnic tables were under snow there when we got there. Uh, we have the creek on big trails, trail covered in snow, and, and all of this snow down in the thing. There was a, a lizard on a rock. It was warm because it was in the sun, but at the same time, that was kind of cool. Yosemite is granite cliffs, waterfalls, vast meadows, and so much more. It is by far the grandest of all the spe special temples of nature I have ever I was ever permitted to enter," said John Muir. John Muir, you have to experience Yosemite. You can't describe it. You have to be there. The day we went in, we were the second to the last car that got into the park because, and you see in the first picture, there's a lot of snow. A car three cars ahead of us went off the road and he landed in a high up in a tree because it was on a hillside. We have a grizzly bear next. We saw nine grizzly bears that trip. Next to the grizzly bear is Bridalville Falls. Below Bridalville Falls is Morrow Rock. And underneath the entrance to, or underneath where we went in, that is called Mirror Lake. Uh, that it happens to be our son and daughter-in-law. They came over from San Francisco to spend a long weekend with us and uh, be able to, uh, we had some alone time together, I guess you could say. <laughs> Crater Lake is our next park at a depth of 1,932 feet. It is the deepest lake in the U.S. with extremely clear water. The lake is in the cal caldera of Mount Maz Mazama. We have a picture of the lake. Crayola has tried to reproduce that color and has not been able to do it yet. The picture beside it is Garfield Peak, the highest peak in the point. Below us, the Native Americans came to the park. It is part of their sacred ground and they were doing a celebration there. We never could find out what it was, but uh, they were there doing their thing. And the last picture, you see in the side of that mountain an orangish color, that is called Pumice Castle, uh, as just an interesting point. And there are several other things along that face of that mountain that have names that you can't see as readily as you can see Pumice Mountain. Glacier is our next part. It's where the sun never shines. It's in Montana. We were there for five days. We finally left because it wasn't getting any better. And it either rained, snowed, sleeted, hailed, or a combination of the above. The sun broke out one afternoon and we saw a beauty that was un, un, uh, unsurpassed. We will return. And by the way, now we are now in the Northwestern parks in Alaska. Uh, we have falls on Indian Creek, once again, a small creek. The lushness of the vegetation is just gorgeous. Indian Pike, which is the next picture, is a parasitic plant that survives by borrowing nutrients from certain fungi, trees, and decaying plant matter. And the last picture is the fall. That is what we saw most days that we were there. Our next park is Mount Rainier in Washington. It's iconic scenery, lush vegetation, and an active volcano. Uh, Comet Falls there above uh, Mount Rainier was it was a it was kind of a long trip in, but well worth the hike because if you look at it, it's absolutely gorgeous. The next picture, and I fell in love with this little bridge that had been built 
I don't know the name of the falls behind it, but it's on Von Trump Creek. The fox that you see is the Mount Rainier red fox. Now, if he's a red fox, shouldn't he be red? No, he is endemic to this park. The last picture that we have is Mount Rainier with the fall foliage in front. North Cascade, like Kings Canyon, is a backpacker's paradise with only one short, unimproved road into the park. The only way to get there is to hike. Now, North Cascade is divided into two, two districts, the north and the south, and in between it is a national recreation area where we camped. Uh, North Cascades is, but it's a true wilderness and the part that we saw was beautiful. The first picture is Statattle Trail and uh, along Statattle Trail, the next picture is the area of Blue Tuft that you, or the structure of Blue Tuft and I have forgotten what Blue Tuft it is and I was supposed to look it up before I came and I didn't. But anyway, it's normally a bright bluish color. I guess the sun was not quite right that day, but just it stands out. It's very uh, predominant. The lake down below is the Diablo Lake and we're back to our small, that's the Happy Creek waterfall. Olympic National, uh, Olympic National Park is multiple parts in, in one. From rugged seashore to rainforest to the Olympic mountaintops, diversity is the game. Do you want to come this, to this park to stroll in the whole rainforest with massive trees, lush vegetation, and Roosevelt, hike, uh, Roosevelt elk? Hike in the mountains with Olympic marmots and magenta paintbrush. Head to the tide pools, sea stacks, arches, and beach exploration. Explore soul dugs and enjoy hot springs and beautiful waterfalls. It is truly a dynamic, interesting park. The first picture up there is an elk laying in the grass at the visitor center. Next to that picture is a, uh, is a whole rainforest. The far picture is the trail to Calalot Beach. Over, it's the Calalot Beach Overlook Trail, but you actually can get to the beach. In the middle of the screen is lettuce lichen, and I just love it. At Rialto Beach, you can see the hole in the wall and sea stacks behind that, which are, uh, is all. Oh, okay, now we're going to our Alaskan park. We have been to four of the eight Alaskan parks. Denali is our first one. It rivals any park we have been to for its diversity of plant and animal life. 28 moose, six grizzlies, caribous, too no, numerous to count, and a hillside herd of mountain oaks, goats, and two wildlife dramas. It is a true wilderness. The first picture we have is one of the buses that goes back to the wilderness area of the park. Next to that is fire, fireweed, which is the Alaska uh, wildflower. The picture over close to that is, we were dropped off on our second trip and our first trip in at mile marker 53. And uh, we were going back into a canyon to see a waterfall. Unfortunately, we encountered one of our wildlife dramas where a mom and her two cubs were being chased by a grizzly bear. He wanted to kill the grizzly so he could mate with her but she outsmarted him and she won. Instead of going, we spent so much time watching that drama, we didn't have a lot of time left. And we went and we went over to this ridge where we could uh, go back a little ways and see, plus one of the uh, ridge lines down on the side of it was scree and we could ski down the scree. The picture down below the little house, the one under at the end, the second trip that we took back in, was to go to the end of the road. And so that is Johnny and I with the sound, sign at the end of the road. The cabin above that was Fanny Quigley's residence. She was an early pioneer in the region. She lived there from the 20s, 30s into the 40s. She was a pioneer and lived the pioneer life. The next picture with the creek in it 
is uh, at Savage Creek. And that is as far as you can drive your personal car into the park. The, everything past that, you have to be on a park bus to go. Glacier Bay is uh, in Alaska's Inside Passage. Glacier Bay is more than glaciers. It's abundant sea life, beautiful vistas, delicate plants, wild animals, and frigid waters. We went out on a canoe trip one day. We went over to one of the islands to explore it, and it was just beautiful. We did a hike with a ranger another day, and on that tree is growing bear bread, and it's not bread. It's, it's hard. It's wood. It's hard, and the natives collect that to use it as things in their house. Along the up, opposite rim is, you will see, mountain goats, grizzlies, a grizzly and a sheep that were we saw along the way. We did a whale trip, and there you see two of eight whales that circled our boat when he stopped to see if we could see any whales. They're just we had several. We had them breaching the. We had them coming up out of the water. It was so much fun. The last picture is the end of Glacier Glacier Bay, which was absolutely beautiful. We took a boat ride up there. Uh, next park is Kenai Fjords. It is water, wildlife, and thunderous calving glaciers. There is a humpback whale that is breaching. Uh, Alec Glacier is over to the side of him that comes down to the water's edge. Exit Glacier below the whale is one that we hiked to in the park, and it was it was absolutely gorgeous. Now the next picture will have more. Uh, explanation when we get to it. It is a fish wheel. The natives are the only ones that are allowed to harvest fish. And we were up there just at the start of the salmon run. This is one that they have at the visitor center that is not in use. But our next park, we come to Wrangell St. Elias which is our third park that is a backpacker's paradise. We have a picture of Root Glacier up at the top, and it is just beyond the Kennecott Mines, which uh, they produced copper during their heyday. And that was a total community. They had schools, they had a hospital, they had all the, whatever you needed to survive because this road, that dirt road you see is 60 miles long. So, and it is not, we started to go back there on in our camper because there's a campground you can camp in there. And we got five miles in and it was so rough and so joggy. Oh, it was just nerve wracking. Plus there were all kinds of railroad spikes and everything in the road. We decided to turn around and go back the next day and take an outfitter took us back there. But it was really a beautiful sight to see and to visit all of the parts of the copper mine. Down at the bottom of that is pink shooting star that we saw so much of it in uh, Great Basin in, the, in that meadow there. And that's what they look like individually, just like our shooting stars. And the last picture there are the natives on the Copper River. Their fish wheels are in the river and they are harvesting the uh, fish that come through. Oops. And that is the end of my presentation. I will say that is our trusty camper that has carried us. We started out with the pop-up trailer, but national parks don't like pop-up trailers unless you're in a hard-sided vehicle. We had to take all of our food, pots and pans, clothes that had food odors on them. Food, it was just crazy. So we got we bought that one. And then the last picture on this are dandelions. We think dandelions are bad here. These are dandelions that grow in Denali. And you notice they're up above my knee. They're huge. Wow. But anyway, so I thank you for having me. And I'll ask Marianne now, does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Barbara. That was incredible. I loved your stories and photos. So fascinating. We do have one question that has come in, and it's from Suzanne, and uh, she asks, what is your favorite park within six hours of here? Oh, there's so many, believe it or not. Actually, 
Great Smoky Mountains. I have my heart is in the Smokies. I grew up going there, and it is just the biodiversity is just amazing. You can hike in the coves, you can hike up the mountains, you can just do a flat hike if you want to, if you're adventuresome, but uh, it is just truly beautiful. I also like Congaree, just the fact that all of and I want to go back in the spring with the canoe to canoe in there where I said that, you know, it, it became water. So, I mean, there's each national park is unique and was preserved for a unique reason. And as far as having, I have some that I kind of like more, but they're all so different. Um, it's, but the Smokies would be, and of course, Mammoth Cave, and I want my husband to go on the cave trip with our grandson. That is, uh, you don't wear good clothes. In fact, you go to probably right. the Salvation Army store and buy something, and go, right. you come out looking, the people that come out of them, mud's all over their face, their clothes and everything. You're crawling on your stomach and everything through there. So they're just, it's just absolutely amazing. Wow, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I enjoyed it. Thank you, Barbara, for letting us be armchair visitor travelers to the places that you and your husband have found to be so special. The friends are grateful to all of you who have renewed your membership for another year. Some memberships have lapsed and we miss you and your library needs you. Please consider renewing your membership. New friends are always welcome. And as a special welcome to the downtown friends, we are including with all new memberships until the end of May, a $5 gift certificate to our downtown bookstore. In addition to the one-time gift certificate, which will be mailed to you with your membership card, I wanna remind you of the other benefits of membership. You get a three week checkout for all books and audio books, two weeks for DVDs and Blu-rays, cover to cover the library's newsletter emailed to you bi-monthly, and members only access to book sales, which we will resume as soon as possible. But most importantly, friends support our library. 100% of all book sales goes to support the library. Membership forms are available at the downtown bookstore during our current hours, which are 12 to 3, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, or from the display rack at the 25 cent book display rack behind the main desk or probably the simplest way is the link on the library's homepage, which is hmcpl.org forward slash friends forward slash join. Is that right, Marianne? She that said is I right. right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Please friend your library by joining the Friends of the Library. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm going to unmute everyone now. And if you'd like to uh, have uh, conversations about Barbara's um, presentation, uh, feel free to do so. We'll stay on here for about five more minutes. Thank you all for attending. <clears throat> Barbara, thank you for your presentation. Oh, thank you for coming. I enjoyed it. It was a trip back memory lane. I just love it. Love it. I think we got it. I hope we got a good recording of this. I believe we did. It still says we're recording. So I guess we'll see. I'll let y'all know shortly. Who is that in that upper right picture? That is, that's unusual. Gosh. This one, me? Me? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. Again, I want to thank you all for coming. Barbara, thank you so much. Martha, thank, thank you, you for letting me help you all do this. I really appreciate it. It's been a great experience. And um, I hope we, you all have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. Good job, Martha. Thank you. Chin Venters. <laughs>